respect. Oh, okay. Well, we're truly blessed here at Freedom. We have a special presentation today by the Praise Dance team. And so uh, if you can all get back to your seats, uh, I would just like to introduce them. I don't know if we're going to turn the lights down, but give them a, a, a loud and hearty welcome.
Uh. I taught all those young guys all my moves, the secrets out of the bag. Well, we want all of our kids to come on up. All of our young people, come on up, come on up, come on up. Okay, fifth and sixth graders are going to stay in here today. You guys, did you guys like that dance song? You guys like that dance song? Hey, can we get that track one more time? Can we play it back one more time? I want to see you guys do your best dances. Turn it up. Turn it up, DJ. Oh, you guys are scared? Are we scared up here? Oh, oh, oh. Too much fun in church. Caleb starting to do the robot. We have to stop it right now. Stop it right now. Cut it out. You all need to get back serious about Jesus. All right. Woo. Woo. I had to stop it because I was already starting to sweat. Well, let's stretch our hands towards our young people. Father, we pray that they would grow and learn about you, that they would understand how great you are this day. Bless them. Speak to their little minds, we pray. Amen. All right, all right, family. Walk, no dancing on the way out. Serious. Oh, that just got so crazy. I forget how quick you guys can turn up, as they say. Well, you all doing okay today? How many people had a graduation or a prom last night or uh, something you had to go to? Just wave at me. And you're here, but you're, you're tired, so I'm going to have to just walk through this quickly. But stand with me if you're able. I'm excited about the word today. This is one of the most important parables most scholars believe in the entire book of Matthew and some for the entire Bible and we're gonna go to Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16 Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16 and I'm reading in the NIV for those who are following along But before I jump into chapter 20, I want to give everyone here a little bit of context. <clears throat> and so I want you to turn back a page or scroll to the left to chapter 19, starting in verse 27. And you can read the rest of it later, but the culmination of it is Peter is sitting there with Jesus in verse 27. And Peter says, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? I like Peter. Because he asked those questions that we're all thinking. If I'm going to be following you, Jesus, what's in it for me for real? You know? And Jesus says, truly at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will all sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake 
will receive a hundred times as much. Have you given up anything for Jesus? That verse should be encouraging. And will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So th that's just a little bit of context, but Jesus likes to add a little bit more to it just so Peter doesn't get the big head. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner in chapter 20 who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever's right. And so they went. He went out again at noon, and then about three in the afternoon, and he does the same thing. About five in the afternoon, when the work day is almost over, he went out and still saw some people standing around and he asked them why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing they said well no one has hired us and he said to them you also go and work in my vineyard and when evening came the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired going on to the first and the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius they were hired at, they worked an hour, and they received a denarius. So when those who came who had been slaving all day, they saw them get the denarius, and they expected to get more, but each of them also received a denarius. I just wish I showed up late. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the Palestinian sun. And he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. Oh, man. I want to give the one who was hired the last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Ooh. Or are you envious because I'm generous? Ooh, these are powerful questions. Oh my goodness, I'm excited about this one. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Father, I thank you for you exposing the reality of who you are. That you are a good, good father. That your generosity overwhelms us. That James says that you are the giver of every good thing. So Lord, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. That we would have the heart of the father for those who are broken. And that envy wouldn't rise up in our heart when you, we see you blessing others. Father, because your goodness reigns over all of us. So we bless you today. Teach us who you are in the kingdom of God, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You all can have a seat in the presence of the Lord. You know, one of the uh, sitcoms that marks our life and times over the last 20 years is a, is a show called uh, The Office. How many people have heard of The Office? You know, maybe you don't watch it. You know, you're watching Scandal or something else un un ungodly. Um, <laughs> But the office is about these individuals that work at the Dunder Mifflin uh, paper company, you know, and, and what's the, I can't remember, guys, Steve Carroll or something. Time Magazine, talking about this sitcom, The Office said that producer Greg Daniels created not a copy, but an interpretation that sends up distinctly American work conventions. And that America loved watching a show that depicted their workplace environment in a comical way. So we come home and we relax by watching others work on TV. And you might say, well, that is very strange, but I, I, I brought that up to say why this parable of the vineyard might have been important to a first century Jewish person that was hearing this, because the parable is very realistic. 
even though it uses some e exaggerated features, which I want to unpack just for a couple minutes, and then I'll get into the meat of what I want to talk about today. The owner of this vineyard is probably reasonably well off. He, he has a decent amount of money, but he's not so wealthy that he would leave oversight of his vineyard to agents. Uh, the picture of someone hiring people that are day laborers from the market at the time of need is a very realistic picture of the working life in, in first century Palestine. So the, and the wage that he gave them, a denarii for a day, is basically a day's wages. Uh, 200 denarii a year would have marked the poverty line in ancient Israel. If you made 200 denarii a year or less, you were, you were impoverished in ancient Israel. So a, a, one of those denarii a day was, was a decent day's wages, but you ain't going to touch someone and say, you ain't going to get rich with a denarii. But, but this also, in their mind, would also have some major exaggerations that you might not pick up on, but the number of hirings would have been excessive, and it would have hardly been conceivable to imagine this wealthy, you know, vineyard owner going out there, considering how far that vineyard was from the marketplace, that he would keep going back, unless this vineyard was close to the marketplace, which we don't know. The other questions you might have that are exaggerations is why were the last people hired not seen earlier? You know, why couldn't the owner just calculate his needs? You know, you've been doing this vineyard business for a while. You probably knew you needed some more people. So how come when you went out there to the marketplace, you didn't just hire every, everybody at once? But the only reason it becomes problematic is if you think parables are always true to life. Because parables are not always true to life. They're, they're sort of allegories. They're stories that are teaching us things about the kingdom of God and, and things that we don't readily grasp. And so the repeated hirings are set up to enable to, for the parable to make its point. And the point is this. The first thing you need to know about this parable is that the owner is, is somewhat extravagant with his money. I want to work for that guy. He's a little bit extravagant. The other thing that you, that you might take away immediately from this parable, which we all picked up when I read it, and it's not that deep, is that you also believe it is unfair for the person who worked one hour to get the same as the person who worked 12. Oh, come on. You know, I quit. I quit. Joanne, I quit. I said, you think it's unfair for the person who worked one hour to get the same as the person who worked 12 hours? And just Curtis said, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> Do you think it's unfair? Thank you. That's so all I was getting. Just say, I don't need an amen, just a nod and say, that makes, we all were thinking that with you, Pastor. Now, one other piece I want to unpack before I jump into this, because this is some good stuff in this parable. But I wanted to also get, wrap our minds around the life of a day laborer. Uh, unemployment in ancient Palestine was a continual problem. A and slaves oftentimes, and you can't think of slaves in the context of the U.S., slaves back then had an easier life than the day laborers because their owners were protecting their investments. So the day laborers were, were very unique. They were like individuals. If you've ever done house projects, you'll notice when you go to Home Depot, you'll see some people standing outside the door saying, hey, I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of that, hoping that you hire them for the day. But what happens is when you're a day laborer, because you're not an investment of the actual owner, they could hire you for short periods of time, they could overwork you, they could even abuse you without having to worry about any future or added investment over your life. And the work day was always a 12-hour day, sun up to sunset. So the sun was be if you work 12 versus 1, the sun was on your back for a while and you see these folks coming in as the as the clouds are coming up, it's getting a little bit cooler and the breeze is coming through and they're like I'm here ready to work. 
It's like 4.30. I'm ready to work. <laughs> there is a difficulty to this job. And the poverty of these day laborers was so obvious that in the Torah, in the, in the first five books of the Bible, they, the law required that you were to pay them at sunset because these people needed the money to survive. Leviticus 19.13, if you keep asking me those questions, says, do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. You got to pay these people because they need it to live. And 200 denarii a year could barely keep a small family going. The rich were rich and the poor were poor. But this gives us a good idea what was running through the minds of those listeners as Jesus is telling this parable. And it said, those who were hired last worked only one hour. And they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. And he answered, I am not being unfair to you, friend. I like how he says that, friend. We'll get to that. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one. I don't ask you. You were going to work here for this, for this amount. This is what we agreed to. But I want to take my money and give the last guy I hired the same that I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm so generous? Now, I want you to notice the questions. You need to write these questions down. First question, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? These might be the most important questions of all of life. <laughs> Second question, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? The last question, are you envious because I am generous? Whenever you hear the Lord ask a question, don't answer. No, I'm being for real. Good master, what must I do to be saved? Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Are you saying that I'm God? Oh, come on, Jesus. Don't See, whenever you hear the Lord ask a question, do not answer. As soon as you hear the question, it is time for an altar call. It's the way... When you hear the question, you need to just admit what is wrong in your own heart. This is the high point of all the parables of Matthew. Why? Because it unpacks all of life's deepest questions in a simple parable. The first question, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? I wasn't unfair to you. See, this, this deals with the question of why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? See, none of us really want to walk around life wronging God, right? But have you ever felt like God wronged you? Mm. Have you ever felt like you just got a bad hand? You've never... You've never come to the place where you said, God... Why would you be unfair to me? You've never come to that place. You've never questioned the goodness of God. I thought we had some real saints in here. The first question deals with that. The second question says, can't I do what I want with my own money and my own workers? That's really a theological question about the sovereignty of of God or better put does God have to answer to y'all maybe <laughs> I'm, I don't know why I'm meddling so much today I'm sorry I'm just sorry in advance to all of our visitors maybe it's just none of your business how generous God is 
don't, if God asks a question, just don't say anything. The last question, are you mad because I'm good? Are you envious because I'm generous? One scholar calls this the sinfulness of the seriously committed. Or, or the godly in need of grace, or I'll make it real plain, or the older brother syndrome. Somebody will catch that later. All right, okay. Before we frame this discussion up, I want to give you one verse as a primer, something to just keep in the back of your mind as we move forward. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. You don't even need to look it up or write it down. You already know it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. With that in mind, touch someone and say, get ready. I want to talk to you about envy, justice, and the goodness of God. And I wanted to start it off with a question. Why is goodness often the occasion of anger in our lives why is goodness in someone else's life oftentimes the occasion of distress in our no one knows what i'm talking about okay think of the commercial for the bank ally and one kid walks in and she wants a pony and she gets this play pony and she's like oh pony a pony. I have a play pony. And she's sitting on the pony. And it's amazing play pony with its plastic hair and plastic ears and plastic eyes. And she's so excited. You would have thought the kingdom of heaven fell upon her. And then the girl behind her also gets a pony. And she comes riding in on a real pony. The immediate response of that young girl says, you, di you didn't say I could have a real one. D.L. Moody once told the fable of an eagle who was envious of another that could fly better than he could. And one day the, the bird saw a sportsman with a bow and arrow and said to him, I wish you would bring down that eagle up there. And the man said, if he had some feathers for his arrow. So the jealous eagle pulled out one out of his wing and the arrow was shot, but it didn't quite reach the rival bird because he was flying too high. And the first eagle pulled out another feather and then another until he had lost so many that he himself couldn't fly. And the archer took advantage of the situation, turned around and killed the helpless bald bird. And Moody made this application. He says, if you are envious of others, the one you will hurt the most by your actions will be yourself. Why do people find it so hard to rejoice over the good that enters into other people's lives? And why do we spend so much time calculating how we have been cheated and wrong when we're so blessed this is what Kierkegaard called the sin of comparison. ABC News, had, they did a special on happiness and found that we are not happy if we make more money. We are only happy if we make more money than the people around us. So how can you be a part of the kingdom, which is a community of people? We will never fully realize the type of community that we can have. Love can't really be experienced as long as we keep comparing ourselves with others and calculating what is due us. And living with envy over what other people have, their place in life. What kind of car do they drive? What kind of house do they live in? How many kids they have? There's so many realms where you can be envious. Give me my justice, God. <laughs> that might not be you, but I don't care who you are. Don't we always think we deserve a little more? And this parable teaches me about myself. 
am I concerned really about justice or am I just jealous? Is justice the weapon that I use to limit God's generosity in other people's lives? Okay. Well, Pastor, what is justice? What is this? What is this? I mean, what is this? They're on the same field. What is justice? Well, one thing justice is not. Let me start there. Justice is not just not doing wrong. We all feel as though the poor who were hired later should have been paid less and it's we feel like it's wrong to pay them more and we're seeing that sometimes when someone receives good we feel injustice right sometimes if we perceive it to be unfair we feel injustice but God in this parable starts to redefine justice the second thing that justice is not is justice is not keeping poor people in a poor state some of us say it would have just been better to not hire them at all. Then everyone would have been fine. But that's not really God's justice either. Justice is also not defined by your and my self-centered interests. In other words, all because I want something doesn't make it justice. That's not the way God's justice works. Justice also isn't just passive, waiting for someone to violate it. Wow, what an injustice we just saw. Now we recognize that there was an injustice because someone violated it. That, that's not what justice is. How, how many people want to know what God's view of justice is? I'm not going to tell you if you don't want to know because this is, this is valuable stuff. Does anybody want to know what God's view of justice is? It's this. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh mortal man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to act justly, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. He says, what do I require of you to do justice? Because justice is action. Justice is when we you want to be a part of the kingdom of God. You want to have the heart of the Father. You have to start seeking the good for all people, especially the poor and the broken. But all people, Israel, if they were to define justice, they would say it would be apprehending the heart of the Father for those who are broken. And I would redefine it slightly and say, apprehending the heart of the Father for all people, especially those who are broken. See, that's, this is how we create, the, the, this is how the kingdom of God forcefully advances because when people get around us, our mission isn't just to keep you in your place. Our mission is to find out the broken pieces and to love mercy and to love compassion, and to love to see you back in a place of glory and where God sees you at. <laughs> Fixing the broken. When you see the young men come in here from uh, different places and they're struggling in life, and you know they're only 19, they have their whole life ahead of them, you should love mercy and love the brokenness in them and begin to build them up. And, oh, man, oh, they, got, oh they got a better job than I have? That should be your desire. See, because what you're not, what we're not getting, church, is that if I live my whole life building up the broken, people will look at me and say, "There's nothing to him. He's not this. He's not that. His house ain't that big. His car ain't that nice." But when I step into heaven, the reordering of principles, the last, become first. You want, to, you want to be a participant in this justice of God. What you have to give up, number one, is envy. It can have no place. No place. That's a hard one. It should have no place in the mind of a believer. The second thing you have to give up is the calculation of your rewards. 
what, what am I deserving of? What do I, what should I, where should I be at right now? What is mine? What is mine? What is mine? You have to give up the quest to be first in line. Remember, Peter? We left everything to follow you. What then will there be for me now? I want you to imagine Peter hearing that, knowing the mindset of the day worker. You're standing outside waiting for your name to be called. You have a job for the day. Your family will eat today. This is a proud moment for you. I'm going to go work and I'm going to get my denarii. It's, it's tough labor. It's a tough life. But you've made it to today. You're feeling good about yourself until you find out that someone in the same position only had to work one hour to receive the same wages you got. And all of a sudden, your pride and your strength and all who you were just sunk and you start looking low. You were happy all day until you found out someone in your same situation got a better deal than you did. This thinking permeates the life of every single human being. Why did, she, why did they get that promotion? And I'm not just talking about unbelievers. I'm talking like sometimes we could, family members, friends, people you know, Ray Ray and them. You know, it just doesn't matter. And you go up to them and you say, oh, congratulations, Bob. I'm so, ha I'm so happy for you. And it's just so, it's just so, I'm so happy. We're so happy for you. And you're just like, I'm so happy for you. Or your brother or sister makes a good investment. And I'm so, and they, where do they live now? They bought another house where? In Arizona? We're so happy for you too. And then you start looking up, but what about me, God? Oh, you think that's just a, a, a secular thing? It's in the church, too. Why, Greg, Greg got to preach last month. Why am I not preaching? How come they're elders? How come they're deacons? I've been serving the Lord. It's my turn. It's my, I'm, it's my spot now. <laughs> but we have to give up our quest to be first, because in God's kingdom, what appears to be last will be first. What does this teach us about God? Why, did, why do scholars think this is one of the greatest parables in all of Scripture? What is it telling us about the God I love? Because it's always about him. I want you to know why this is such an epic parable. Because what it tells us about God is that you thought God was a fair God. But he is not fair. He is unfair. Because fairness would be to destroy those who are his enemies. Fairness would be to let you and me receive the just punishment for our sinfulness and for our rebellion. Fairness would be God showing up this morning and saying, I know what you did last night. Fairness would place God at odds with us. Fairness is allowing his wrath to be meted out against us. Fairness would be eternal separation from our heavenly father. Fairness would be all of us dying the second death. But I am so thankful today that I do not serve a God who is fair. He is very unfair. He's the type of unfair God that likes to set up a kingdom. I'm thankful that he's so unfair that he's the type of God that if I came here today and I didn't know God and I met him today and I said, Jesus, I place my faith in you, I don't have to compete with Bill and Brenda or Greg and Donna or Pastor Thad and Joanna or T.D. Jakes or the Pope or anyone that has served them their whole life because he's so unfair he says that's my son that's my daughter he calls me his own he says I'm adopted into the family he's so unfair I'm thankful that this unfair God erased my debt he loves us unconditionally mm. don't ask questions I was out golfing this past week. I know, surprise, 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 surprise. Spoiler alert. <clears throat> hey, that's my mission field, don't hate. But 
a couple guys from the gym, and we, we were at Lincoln Oaks, and we, we get to this par three, which is just like you got to make it in the hole in three shots, as a, whatever. And one of the guys uh, hits just a terrible shot. I mean, he might have killed some people across the street or something. It's just terrible. And he goes, God dang it. But the actual word. And they all know I'm the pastor in the group, right? And so he looks over at me. He's like, hey, <laughs> sorry, pastor. I don't want to go to hell. That's what he said. I ain't trying to go to hell. I'm sorry, pastor. And, and my immediate response was I said, God probably thought that too when he saw that shot. <laughs> But then I said this, I said, I don't believe that God is that petty. I said, if he sends his son to die for your unrepentant, sinful, ugly self who can't hit a golf ball to save his life, you think when he hears you cuss, he goes, oh, that's it, hellfire and damnation for that one. Burn him up, hellfire and damnation for that guy. because you don't understand who he is. You don't understand the lengths that he would go to win your heart. You don't understand the mission of salvation that started before the foundation. Because you're out here looking for the greatest love and God is like, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. And while you were yet my enemies, I laid down my life for you. And you say, but I don't really know if he loves me like you're saying, Pastor. I think he is petty. Well, he said neither depth nor height nor dominions, nor principalities, no nothing, nothing, nothing in this life can separate you from his love. Now go and do the same. Be unfair in your love and in your generosity and in your lifting up people that are broken. Then you'll see the kingdom pumping through your veins. You have to understand the heart of the Father for all people, especially those who are broken. Broken. In this world, it's easy to get broken. But kingdom people, you all are called to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God who is not petty like us. Stand with me if you're able to. Hallelujah. Man, what a word, Jesus. I don't know, I'm talking to myself. That word spoke to me. I deal with some issues. If that word spoke to you, I'm gonna ask Joey to come on up. I know we have one other thing left to do, but I just wanna, I just wanna pray and believe that this is go going to seal into our hearts today. And if, if you heard the word today and you're thinking to yourself, I, I, need, I need to let go of some of these things, and I hear the word today, just lift your hands up with every eye closed. And Lord, I pray now for every person that is responding right now to the word. Lord, give them a revelation of who you really are. Hmm. Give them even a dream and a vision and a picture of the lavish generosity you've poured out on them. God, even reveal some of those deep mysteries that we might not know until we get there, that they might walk around understanding your great lavish generosity on their lives. And Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that we would be attentive and looking to express the heart of the Father to those who are broken in this life. To those who are wondering, God, let them experience your generosity and your love flowing out of kingdom-minded people like us, God. Let it be so for your glory and for your name's sake. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Let every believer in this place say amen, amen. God bless you, family.